pursuing the one. And today my focus is going to be the power of your story. The power of your story. Does anybody like storytelling? Many of us do it, yes. Our parents tell us stories at night, bedtime stories and all of that. Some of you, they read to us. But when I was growing up, it was stories that my parents tell. I don't know if they were true stories or they were just stories that were formulated that we told them and they just transfer it from one generation to the next and we had all those fables that we told us and those were like our bedtime we gather around the fireside and then they'll tell us one nice story and that was what like that was like one of the best parts of the day when everything is done you've eaten and you just come and sit around the fire and then they tell you one nice story which i don't think were true stories i think they were just fables that that generation told and so we just learned inherited them and but stories are so powerful, they are so incredible, and, uh, and so this morning we are looking at the text, uh, two um, uh, scriptures, and Jesus had come and Jesus had died in Matthew 2, chapter 28 that we read, Jesus comes, he dies, he resurrects, and he's about to leave and he gives an instruction to his disciples, that is our instruction to he tells them in Matthew 28, all power, all authority has been given to me in, heavens and, uh, in heaven and on earth. Other versions will tell you that in the Aram Aramaic particularly has, has a text that says, as I was with you, like Jesus, and the Father is saying, as I was with you, so the Father is going to be with you. Like the same way God was with Jesus, so God is going to be with us as Jesus leaves to go. And so he says, because of that reason, I'm giving you the authority to go preach the gospel, make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and teach them to observe everything that I have commanded you. That's the command of the disciples. So the disciples stand there having heard what Jesus said, and then they watch Jesus ascend to heaven. But then Jesus had given them instructions. Not only was it instruction for them to make disciples, the first instruction was for them to wait and go up to Amal. And wait until the, um, the Holy Spirit comes. So they go up uh, and, and they are waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. And on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes. 120 people gather on the day of Pentecost and the Holy Spirit comes upon them. They are filled with the Spirit, so empowered by God. And they start telling the story. On that day, as people gathered, hearing these people speaking in different languages, they're like, what is happening? This is crazy. Then Peter stands up for the first time and he tells them the greatest story of humankind. He says, this Jesus that you crucified, this guy, this is who he truly was. Let me tell you about Jesus a little. And he tells the story of who Jesus was. And by the time Peter is ending his story, 3,000 people give their lives to Jesus. By the time you go to Acts chapter 3, that, was, that happened in Acts chapter 2. By the time you go to Acts chapter 3, another incident happens. Peter and John, they are going into the temple uh, to go pray like normal. 3 p.m. probably, as they, enter into the temp as they are entering into the temple, they see this crippled man by the gate. And this crippled man has been there. He's been coming. That's what he does. Just comes and begs for arms. And they ask the, the crippled man. Peter looks at him at this time. I think he's almost like, like I'm tired of you being in the space. Some things need to change. And the crippled man is begging for money. And Peter and John say, sorry, silver and gold we don't have. But what we have, we give you. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And when that guy rises up and walk and the community hears, then another opportunity to tell the story happens. Then Peter and John, not only are they telling the story of this guy who has been healed, who is now walking, they tell them that it was, it's not just about this guy. There is a Jesus who does the story. And the disciples continue telling the stories. But by the time we go to Acts chapter 8, something happens to the church. Persecution comes. And they are scattered all around the, the, the place. And at times, as much as I don't like persecution, at times persecution is a plus to the church. It is a thing that sets the church on fire. At times we become so complacent when we are so comfortable. A little persecution at times is good. I'm not saying I'm praying for one because I know I have a little feel of what it means. So I'm not praying that it comes. But at times, persecution is what propels people into what God has called them to do. And the disciples scatter all around. And everywhere they went, they kept telling the story. And guess what? Thousands of years later, we see the same gospel in almost every continent of the world. From 120 people to about 3.3 billion, I think, presently of Christians who profess the name of Jesus around the world. Isn't that amazing? The power of telling our stories. 
The gospel has kept growing. The gospel has kept advancing. But what is strange and what is sad is that as much as the gospel, even today, I know they say, oh, Christianity is, is, is declining. It's not true. Christianity is actually growing. It might not be growing where we are, but it's growing in other spaces. And what happened? If you look at Christianity in, in Europe, it's, I think it's about 1.5 lower than the population growth of the entire world. So it's actually in decline in Europe. In America, it's just the same, 3.5, 3.5. The population growth is about 3.5 in the world, and Christianity is about 3.5. So we are not growing. We are not going down. We are just there. We are just happy. We are just sitting. We are just comfortable. We have plateaued. But guess what? In Asia, the, the Christianity is growing 15% higher than the population growth. Talk more of in Africa, 38%. By, I'm a statistic say by the time it's 2030, the highest number of Christians will no longer be in Europe or America. It's going to be in Africa. The core is shifting. But I don't think that is God's will. I think God's will is that everywhere around the world is that the church is growing, we are advancing, we are making an impact. But how does this happen? Is that somewhere something happened and we stopped telling our stories. We became so comfortable and we stopped telling our stories. And when I look at the text in John chapter 4, I feel like Jesus gives us a glimpse of what it means to tell our story. How powerful it is when one person is intentional and willing to tell their story. Or the story of God's work in their lives. And we see in the story in John chapter 4, Jesus is at a well and Jesus meets this Samaritan woman. And the woman comes to Jesus and she wants to get water. And Jesus is like, please, can you give me some water? And the woman is like, how would you and Jew be asking a Samaritan for, for water? I'm not going to go to the details of all the cultural differences today. But the woman, they start a conversation there where the woman, Jesus finally asks the woman, uh, go call your husband. And the woman says, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, I know that. You know, at times Jesus doesn't ask us questions because he really wants an answer. He just asks us questions to provoke something in the inside of us. And the woman says, and Jesus tells the woman, you have five husbands. You've had five husbands. And the one you're staying with now is not even your husband. And I think that, that when I read that story, something in my belly like, how would she have had five husbands? There are two hypotheses. Number one is, she might have been divorced five times. And I'm imagining if she had been divorced five times, you know the emotional trauma that she might have gone through. The brokenness that she'll be experiencing, experiencing the sense of rejection. Was she the cause of the divorce or whether the guys are were the cause of the divorce? And was there something about her actually that made the men keep coming five times? Was there, did she, I'm thinking she probably had a very good character. She was so beautiful. There was something about her that kept attracting them because even now she still would want. So there is something about her, but she has a story, a baggage of brokenness, of emotional, just so much trauma, a sense of rejection, if it is divorce. But another hypothesis is that all the five men she's been married would probably have died. And that's how somehow my strongest in instinct is that all her five husbands died. Because the way she's been treated in town, it's almost like somebody who is cursed. Somebody was rejected, somebody, because she doesn't come to the well with everybody else. She has to come when there is nobody in there, there's nobody at the well. She has to come alone. She's like excluded. She's left alone. She's abandoned now. So what is it about her? What did she do? I'm imagining by the time she lost husband number one, people say, well, this might just have been, it might just happen. Husband number two, ah, husband number two died. What is it? Husband number three died. Husband, husband number five, she's cursed. And so nobody wants to come around her now, so she's alone, she's abandoned, she's rejected. Not only is she grieving the loss of all her husbands, because for everyone that she stayed with, she was emotionally bonded to them. So not only is she grieving all of this loss, but now she's doing it all alone. Doing it in a community that has rejected her, that has abandoned her, that has left her all by herself. But then Jesus comes in and Jesus is willing to have a conversation with her. And what I like about this is that in the community, because if you can tell, if you look at the story, you can tell that this woman was religious. She knew something about God. She did it the way, maybe the, the way of worship was different from the Jewish way, but she knew something about God. She was a religious woman. 
but still the community secluded her. How many times do we do that as a church? We want people who are whole. We don't want broken people. And we say, oh, the church is supposed to be for people who are sick. And when somebody comes in their brokenness, we are the first people to tear them down. And that's how this woman comes in her brokenness. But the good thing is that Jesus sits with her in her brokenness. Jesus sits with her in that space where nobody else wants to sit. And Jesus starts a conversation with her. And this conversation leads this woman to the place of transformation. Where she realizes that, oh my, this is true living water. This is not just another man that I met. This Jesus, what he has is what can change my life. And the amazing, immediately this woman hears about Jesus and her life. And she allows Jesus to impact her. She runs back to the same people who didn't love her. The same people who abandoned her. She runs to the city to tell them the story. And she comes, she tells them, come and see the man who has told me everything about me. And the whole city run. I, I'm, I'm, so there is, she had some influence. I don't know if it's that she was just influential or her story was just so messed up that people wanted to truly come and see. Is it for real? Did this thing really happen? Is she truly changed? Is she, I don't know exactly. But the whole city followed her to come and meet Jesus. And when they come and meet Jesus, they tell, and, and all of them encounter, Jesus speaks to them and all of them are changed. What they tell the woman is that we don't just believe now because of what you said. It's because we ourselves, we have tested and we have experienced. And now we believe. So your story brought us to this place. But we have encountered Jesus for ourselves. One woman's story able to save an entire town. One woman's story of brokenness. And as I was thinking, I was like, why, why is it that people don't like telling their stories? At times it's probably because we think my story is not as powerful like that woman. I wasn't a drug addict. You know, at times when we go for crusades or anybody has ever been to a crusade here, if you've ever been to a crusade or maybe a big church program, when we are telling stories, it's probably stories of, I used to be on drugs and now the Lord changed me. Or I used to be this messed up, you know, like me. Then we can easily tell those stories because we feel like, oh, wow. But guess what? We each have a story. Even for those of us who grew up in church, there was a point in our lives that marked a turning point where it transferred from just being a church thing to a relationship with God. And there is somebody else who's coming to church who have not experienced that transition yet, that your story could be the story that they need to hear. So one of the reasons why at times people don't want to tell their stories is because you feel like your story is not as powerful. Mine is not as important. Oh, mine is so small. Well, I was just praying for direction and, and, and I got direction and I didn't have a big revelation. I just knew that this was a way to follow uh, the way I should go. And so I didn't see Jesus. I didn't hear an audible voice. I didn't have a dream. So it's not a big deal. It is a big deal. Because there is someone else needing direction. And just your story might be what helps them. Or it might be the story of our church place being cleaned. For when our leadership team met and we had the work on the budget, it was thousands of dollars that we're going to, yes, we still have to spend some money to put in some work there. But it was going to cost us thousands of dollars to do some of that work that was done. But guess what? That is a miracle that God preserve some of the resources we're going to spend and it's like God's way of saying I'm providing for you and for, so for somebody that, that that looks like it's not a story but for me that is a big deal do you understand so our stories are important there is no story that is so small you might have been like say oh man I want to stop um, uh, drinking I've just been doing, I've been on this for over and over, and somebody's like, oh yeah, I was, I was so down in drinking, and now I'm 21 years clean, I'm 22 years clean, I'm 23 years clean, you're like, well, mine is just a social drinker, and uh, blah, 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 I know I want to stop, I'm unable to stop, and so I don't really want to tell my story, but there are times when I go for five years, and then suddenly I just come back, yes, when you go for that five years, tell the story, tell the story, there is no story that is so small. Another reason why at times people don't tell their story is that they think that nobody will listen. 
They think nobody wants to listen to my story. And if nobody wants to listen to my story, why should I even tell it? How should I tell how I overcame the grieving of losing my spouse? To come to this place where I can still walk in wholeness, I can still sing, I can still rejoice, I can still shout. Many people think that who wants to hear that story. But if I tell you that there are thousands who want to hear that story, you will not believe it. So many people at times, the reason why we don't tell our stories is because we think that nobody wants to listen to our story. And the third reason I think that we don't tell our stories is because we don't see God in our stories. We think that the things that happen to us are just coincidences. And we don't see God working in the pieces of our lives. Putting the pieces together, even when they feel like messed up, he knows how to put those pieces together. When we are able to see God in the little details of our life, of our lives, then we will tell those stories with boldness, with courage. I think one of the things I really like or I miss about the African church is we have testimony time. Anybody knows what testimony time is? It's a testimony of what God has done. And there are times you have one, and my grandma will just come to say, Woo, I just want to tell the Lord, thank you, I'm still saved. And that is her story, that she is still saved. Or another mother will come like, oh man, I was trusting God for school fee. And when I went to work about this week, and for my children, I went to work this week, but my boss gave me an extra increase. And they will praise God for it. Oh, I was, I was really praying for this thing. And then this person came to me and he gave me just what I was praying. Every, there's something somehow about most African Christians is that we attribute every goodness that we see in our lives to God. And when you start attributing the goodness that you see in your life to God's goodness towards you, then it becomes easy to tell the world that he is good. But when we feel like everything that I have is because of my strength of how hard I work, then we don't see God in the pieces of our story. But we all know that we are where we are. It's because of God's grace. Because there is certainly somebody who is stronger than you, someone who is wiser than you, someone who is more capable than you, but God's mercy and grace has been working the pieces of your life. You know that time when you were about to make a decision that would have caused your whole life to be messed up. But somehow you don't even know why you didn't make that decision. You made this other decision. Because God himself was leading you. Do you see God in your story? When we see God in our story, it changes everything. But what happens when we start telling our stories? The good thing about telling our stories is that nobody can discredit your story. It is your story. There are places where you can't preach where you can tell your story. There are people who won't listen to you preach one, the kind of sermon I'm preaching, but they will listen to your story. It doesn't matter the religion, it doesn't matter the background, everybody listens to a story. Everybody listens to a story. I'm going to get my note because I have a few points that I think I really want to talk about. The second thing about why it's important to tell our story is that our story is always right because it is our experience. Your story is right. It's your experience with God and nobody can discredit that. The third thing is that you don't need theological education to share your story. There are many people who say, oh no, I can't preach. Oh, I can't. Do you have a story to tell? Has God been good to you? Have you seen God's hand at work in your life? Can you tell that story? You don't need any education. You don't need any qualification. You can be illiterate and still tell the stories. And that's one of the things, like, um, uh, back home, we have lots of pastors who have gone through seminary, what theological, what theologically sound, what scholars, and all of that. But we also have lots of pastors who don't have all the theological education, who just tell, retell the stories of the Bible. They just go to the Gospels and retell the stories of the Gospels. And that is powerful enough to change lives. Because the stories of God are just tangible. They are powerful. We don't, you don't need any special education to tell your story. The next thing is that your story, okay, I already said I cannot be discredited. Your story can be easily shared where a sermon will not be shared. And your story can be shared anywhere, even in places that are restricted. And the last point 
is that your story is able to change a life. Your story is able to change a family. Your story is able to change a city. You've got a story to tell. And so as the disciples come and they, they, they gather around Jesus and they're asking Jesus, please, would you eat? Then Jesus tells them, sorry, my meat is to do the will of him who sent me. And he says, look, you guys are saying the harvest is not ripe. Oh, people are so hard to accept. People are so hard. We have been trying to preach the gospel. They don't want to accept. And Jesus say, come on. They are all ready. Their hearts are open. Would you just tell them your story? The same thing this woman did. Would you just tell them your story? And I believe that that's what God wanted me to tell you. And I know we look at our city, Lexington, and we're like, God, how do we preach with people to people of different religion? Would you just tell them your story? Are you saved? Do you have Jesus in your life? Have you experienced God in any way? Has God been good to you? That colleague can work all they might need was how God helped you with your kids. And they are struggling with their child. Can you tell them your story? That might be all the need to bring the transformation and the deliverance in their lives. And so Jesus tells, commands the disciples, go and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the text is not like just is go and make disciples. It says, as you go, as you go to work, as you go to school, as you go to your house, as you go to the farm, anywhere you go, when you meet people, tell them the story. And I believe that's God's charge for us today. And the story that has to be told is not a story for only people who are whole. Broken people also have stories to tell. Messed up people also have stories to tell. And I think that's why I like telling my story because I feel like if, if he had not been God, I wouldn't be where I am. And he's not done yet. Every day I see his goodness. Every day. If you ask me at the end of every day, I will certainly tell you one story of God's goodness and God's work in my life. Some days are tougher, but even in the tougher days, I'm able to wake up. I'm like, yeah, I saw the Lord this morning. So has God been good to you? Do you have a story? Is there somebody you can share that story with? That can be the starting point as we try to reach the one in this community. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much that you are so faithful. Thank you for how you are at work in our lives, each one of us, God. We can certainly say we have seen your hand. <coughs> Many of us have been through diverse things and you have helped us. Some of us have made decisions that we didn't even know what the outcome was going to look like. But you let us do the right, make the right decision. Some of us have gone through some difficult stuff, difficult things. Some with loved ones, some with family, some enduring ill health. But you have sustained us in all of them. And we know it's your goodness and your grace. Help us to not ignore those stories of your doings. May we boldly tell those stories to a world that truly needs to hear and know that you were good. So thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this morning is, uh, is World Communion Sunday.